I mean, I knew that there was corruption, but the level of corruption throughout the political system is overwhelming. And I'm talking about the established Democrats and the established Republicans. Consider the statement, money is corrupting politics. It's a statement that 75% of Americans believe to be true in a widespread effect across the country. But what if there was a more sinister problem plaguing the US government? What if that statement was flipped? Politics is corrupting money. We've always focused on the power that contributors may have over politicians, yet paid little attention to how much power politicians have over contributors. What if the problem is not bribery, but has developed into a form of extortion, a game played among the powerful political elite to threaten others, extract wealth, and manipulate citizens into believing they are properly being represented? Executives of well-known American companies have put it bluntly, what has been called legalized bribery looks like extortion to us. You're crazy if you don't play along. They will go after you. It's a huge problem that, by design, is not well understood by the average citizen. So let's pull back the curtain and reveal how politicians trick you into making them rich. Now you accuse me of breaking the rules, and I tell you, I am playing by the rules. The very rules that you and I all agreed upon. The very rules that you and I all wrote together. So yes, I'm guilty as hell, but then so are all of you. The first form of extortion that politicians love to use is a classic and very effective form, the protection racket. Pay me money and I'll make sure your life isn't miserable. Fail to pay me and we'll see what happens. This especially applies when it comes to the ever-changing wave of public disapproval that we see in the modern day. One day you're fine and the next a viral tweet has millions of people online calling for a boycott of your company. The public outcry itself is usually not that big of a deal. Make an apologetic statement, wait a month, and the public will be on to the next thing to be mad about. What's really worrying is when the public outcry leads to politicians doing something about it, implementing new laws, or even bringing forward allegations of wrongdoing. And whether or not politicians do so pretty much entirely depends on whether or not you've been paying your protection racket dues. Let me give you an example. In the years after the historic financial crisis of 2008, cries for the criminal indictment of Wall Street executives and bankers were climbing to an all-time high. CNN predicted many bankers would end up in jail. The Motley Fool declared that hundreds of executives should go to jail. Movements forced their voices to be heard as they called for punishment and a change in the system. Politicians were more than happy to come forward and speak in support of these movements. This reflects the broad-based frustration about how our financial system works. I support the message to the establishment, whether it's Wall Street or the political establishment. We understand their frustration. We applaud their activism. But as time dragged on, we learned shallow verbal support was the only form of support politicians were willing to give. The banks were bailed out and no criminal charges were brought forward. Sure, the Dodd-Frank Act passed, but many saw this as a slap on the wrist and wanted to see the reckless individuals that caused this mess face more harsh consequences for their terrible actions. For a moment, it looked like there was progress. On April 13, 2011, the Senate Committee of Investigations released a scathing report on criminal conduct carried out by Goldman and other firms during the financial crisis. But let's not forget both parties had the 2012 election looming in the distance. This was a perfect opportunity to extort some money, and it worked like a charm. Goldman executives poured money into campaign donations. Many of the executives had never even written large political checks before, but now here they were, writing them for hundreds of thousands of dollars. Right around the same time, both parties held dinners and invited Wall Street executives to solicit ideas about how to improve the economy. It's no wonder by the end of the election cycle in 2012, Wall Street had broken the record for political donations, spending over $170 million. And just like that, the Department of Justice suddenly dropped its criminal investigation. Public outrage is not always needed to intimidate businesses though. At any point, politicians can threaten to introduce legislation that affects an industry's business model. Politicians create new bills that give themselves the opportunity to milk an industry for some extra cash. Whether the bill passes or not doesn't matter. 
they'll still get money in the process. This is especially profitable when you can milk two wealthy industries at the same time by pinning them against each other with one bill, which is exactly what happened with the Stop Online Piracy Act of 2011. This was a bill introduced to combat pirated content online, but it soon became an all out war of spending between the tech giants of Silicon Valley and the movie giants of Hollywood. Big names across Hollywood had been calling for some sort of political action against piracy for years, and it looked like their call was finally being answered. But this bill called for a rework in how the internet works and tech companies were not gonna stand by and just let it happen. Eric Schmidt, the executive chairman of Google, warned that anti-piracy bills would criminalize linking and the fundamental structure of the internet itself. Silicon Valley didn't want to play into the donation game, but they were pretty much forced to. If they wanted to have a meaningful discussion with politicians and convince them to not support the bill, they need to meet in person. Politicians knew this very well, and they said, no problem, just come attend one of the many dinners we happen to be having all across Silicon Valley. It'll only cost you 35,000 per head per dinner. So that's what they did. Politicians hosted dinners and fundraisers all across the Bay Area. And all the big names in technology attended with the hope that they would have a chance to talk about the bill. After the round of dinners, there was suddenly some concern with the bill from the politicians. We will not support legislation that reduces freedom of expression, increases cybersecurity risk, or undermines the dynamic, innovative global internet. And now things got really serious. It was Hollywood's turn to pull out their checkbooks. Fundraising events, dinners, and a frenzy of lobbying followed. The number of companies with skin in the game was staggering. 145 different companies lobbied for or against it in the House, and 157 lobbied for or against it in the Senate. By the end of it, a colossal $104.5 million had been spent lobbying from both sides. But if the whole do what I say or else route is a little extreme for you, well, don't worry. There's another way that politicians can make sure they never have to worry about money ever again. All they have to do is make laws and regulations for wealthy businesses extremely complicated. Executives within successful companies will pay just about anything to avoid legal vulnerability, especially when vulnerability can mean jail time. If they don't understand what the rules are, they will pay someone who does. So politicians draft incredibly convoluted bills, sometimes spanning over 2,000 pages long. Staying within the confines of some of these bills is almost impossible to do. So who better to trust in ensuring that they follow the law than the people who constructed the law themselves? Politicians are more than happy to take some time off politics to join the job market, especially since they basically have an agreement to be immediately hired when they do so. Once they're hired, they can almost name their price. If the industry they're regulating is the banking industry, well, they'll expect to see salaries that range from 400,000 all the way to $1 million. It's the perfect form of extortion. Legal, obscure, lucrative, and simply impossible to avoid. John Allison of the Cato Institute stated that there were often instances when his bank hired firms filled with ex-regulators to deal with complex regulations. The bank was especially interested in those who had just left the government. We felt we had to hire certain consultants who had government relationships. John Hoffmeister, the former president of Shell Oil, saw how the process worked. He's quoted, they deliberately write ambiguity into the law. It's part of a career building process. If you are a congressional staffer, you spend your career crafting complex legislative language. This equips you to leverage your post-government competence. They spend their time making complex bills so that they can have themselves a job a little later on. So the next time you hear politicians arguing over the details of a huge bill, ask yourself, are they arguing for your sake or for their wallet's sake? So we follow the extortion process from your pockets to wealthy businesses and into the possession of these politicians. But we're not done just yet. In most cases, that money is not disposable income for the politicians to use as they please. So how do they make that leap? How do they move the money from restricted campaign usage to money with no restriction at all? Well, it's actually completely legal for politicians to pay themselves a salary when they are running for office. The only problem is if they actually do that and someone finds out, well, they expose themselves to the possibility of negative publicity, which of course is exactly the opposite of what you want when you are actively running for a position within the government. So how do they get around it? Easy, hire family members and family businesses for ill-defined services or undefined purposes. See, that's much less likely to be discovered within the period that you run. In the 2020 cycle, 81 federal candidates disclosed giving a combined 1.3 million in wages to people with their same last name. 
But of course, politicians themselves want to get in on that action too. Letting only their family members become wealthy wouldn't be that fair. So they create ways to get the money to themselves as well. One of the most common ways they do so is through leadership packs. Leadership packs are a special kind of pack it's supposed to be used solely for helping political colleagues hold and win seats. Problem is, the Federal Election Committee has few restrictions on how this money can be used. They do not even restrict the personal use of such funds. And what's really backwards is the fact that the FEC has looked at this for many years, but has determined that they don't have the statutory ability to address this. It would take an act of Congress. So in order to properly regulate politicians, they first need approval from the politicians that they are trying to regulate. I don't see any problems in that, do you? To give you an idea of how unregulated these leadership packs are, well, let's consider the Paul Pack. $6,000 was spent using this pack on personal expenses like fast food, donuts, bar tabs, and golf, which is fairly normal behavior for these packs. But what made this case special was the fact that the politician who owned this leadership pack was no longer living. He sadly passed away months before these bills were racked up. When journalists from the Wall Street Journal tracked down the people associated with this spending, well, they had a simple explanation. The expenditures were necessary because the PAC members had gathered many times as they were all deeply grieving. Bars, golf courses, Dunkin' Donuts, you know, the usual funeral locations. And there was apparently nothing wrong with using the fund for funeral expenses. So you can see why everyone wants a leadership PAC. They basically serve as a second personal bank account. Politicians use them to fund retreats at five-star resorts, pay for first-class airplane tickets, and host events at the most lavish restaurants that you can find. And what if you still have funds in your leadership pack after you retire? There's no more campaigns to run, so surely they can't still use that money, right? Wrong. Amazingly, they can continue to spend however they see fit and can even convert the money to personal funds. See, the American political system has grown into a system with huge leeway for dishonest politicians to fly under the radar and use their power to become incredibly wealthy. As we've seen in this video, what we believe to be a system of bribery could actually be one of extortion played by the permanent class of political elite to line their pockets with the wealth of this country's companies and citizens. Thank you so much for watching all the way to the end. Don't forget to like and comment if you enjoyed the video. It helps me out a lot with the YouTube algorithm and how much it promotes my videos. Along these similar lines, I was thinking of possibly doing a video on the psychology tricks of politicians and political news organizations and how they manipulate your thoughts or you know direct your attention away from certain things. So let me know if you'd be interested in that by commenting down below. And that wraps up for this video. I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.